I'm the Ryan Q. I'm at your account. This video follows one that I recently posted called Problems in Self-Mastery. Well, there are more what we might call problems in self-mastery training and self-mastery progress than the ones I named in that first video. I suppose here maybe I'll just talk about a few more. Let's see. I actually made some notes for a change. Wow, what a glare. Looks a little spooky. <laughs> I made some notes for a change. Let's see. Self-mastery 101. That's what I wrote down. Who is it for? Who is it not for? Problems with self-help. Subconscious mind. Grounding self-mastery in cosmic laws. I have a whole list here. What do I want to talk about in this one? All right. Problems in self-help training and self-help progress. Who is it for and who isn't it for? Well, if I had thought about this, thought this all out previously, I'd have a whole list of who it's for and who it's not for. I'll just come up with some things here. For one, I, myself, I hesitate, strongly hesitate, to give somebody self-mastery training, somebody who has, a, let's say, a mental illness diagnosis. Oh, but then we get into what is mental illness, and at what point do we call something a real diagnosis? And to what extent should the mental illness, at what point, or at what severity, what point of severity of mental illness, should we say, well, this is not for that person? So, I kind of have to just, if I meet somebody one-on-one -on -one and they want my help, and one thing I ask them is, do you have any mental illness diagnoses? Now, if they say yes, this does not mean right away I'm going to count them out. So I kind of have to feel it out on an individual basis. If a person has severe mental illness, then they cannot follow instructions, probably. They're, they're, they're not in touch enough, let's say, with reality. to get a grip on self-mastery. But then again, getting a grip on self-mastery is exactly what they need. But there is a, a person has to be present enough with self-mastery already in order to engage in self-mastery training. I hope you see what I mean here. Let's say a person is psychotic. <clears throat> well, they're not going to be able to benefit much from self-mastery training if a person has multiple personality disorder. <laughs> Which personality am I dealing with today? You know, I, mean, I, hope, I hope you get my point. If, if somebody is schizophrenic, paranoid, and I teach them how to use the power of their will to fine-tune their attention, then in what way are they going to use that? These are questions I have to consider deeply. So if somebody has a severe mental illness, let's just say moderate to severe mental illness, I, I, it, it's not really for them, unfortunately. Another person, another sort of person who it's definitely not for, in my opinion, is somebody who exhibits strong narcissistic, sociopathic, or psychopathic traits. That is, well, in general, they appear to have no conscience. I'm not going to help them. My self-management training program is not for them. It's not for them. <clears throat> then again, there's another way to ask, who is it for and who is it not for? Well, it's, it, there's a point at which people are either, well, they're ready for it. They're ready to at least take a step in the direction of self-mastery. If a person is not ready for it, well, it's not for them. Although, on another level of speaking, is for everybody. So don't get me wrong here in my, you know, saying who it's for and who it's not for. Yet one level of discourse, as I said, is for everybody. But there are some people that I just, I, I won't help with. If a person appears to have 
no conscience, or he thinks there's no difference between right and wrong, or um, has no empathy for others, or doesn't seem to give a damn about cause and effect, then although self-mastery training involves training in cause and effect, a person has to have a little bit of a head start with that whole idea, has to have a little bit of foundation in it in order for me to want to help them with self-mastery. If they have no concern over the effects of their actions at all, and I get a hint of that, then my program is not for them. If a person is addicted to drugs, then self-mastery training is not really for them. Not just my program, but I would say no, nobody's. It's not really for them. Although, it, yeah, it's there for them, and at that level of discourse again, to which I've made multiple references already, yes, it's for them, because it's for everybody, but they're not going to be able to get much out of it. If they're addicted to drugs, if they're having altering states of consciousness, and there are other reasons involved with respect to drug addiction that kind of count them out. If a person is below average intelligence, then they probably aren't going to understand some of the conceptual material. They might not be able to follow instructions very well, but then again, a person of below average intelligence might just be able to follow instructions very well. Perhaps, in some cases, even better than somebody of really high intelligence. <clears throat> um, but they at least need to be able to understand the material and follow the instructions. You must have the mental presence to do that and show signs of having a conscience. Um, and of course they need to be ready for it. They really actually need to be at a point where they are motivated to take steps in the, towards self-mastery. Those are, those are some ideas about who it's for and who it's not for. What's another thing here in my list? <clears throat> oh, self-mastery regime should follow cosmic laws of operation. Well, here's a big problem. What cosmic laws? And why? Why ground a self-mastery training program in cosmic laws of operation? Well, let's, take, let's make an analogy. Let's take a look at the branch of philosophy called ethics. This is to build a comparison here. So I will get to the point. This comparison should make it a little easier to get the point once I get to it. All right, ethics. Ethics is the philosophical investigation into the nature of right action. So one of the jobs of the study of ethics is to define right action. How do we know when an action is the right one as opposed to the wrong one? How do we know whether an action is ethical, whether it's the right thing to do? Well, that's very difficult. If we use an analytic approach, if we want a definitive answer, something that's provable to the inquiring mind, ethics remains somewhat an obscure field of investigation, a difficult field of investigation. There are many reasons for that, for the difficulty. One of them, one of them is that as soon as we lay out a definition of right action, a person wants to know, well, why is that the, de the, the definition of right action? What are you grounding that in? Prove it. So ultimately, we kind of want to 
we're kind of pushed into grounding our ethical theory in a metaphysical theory. In other words, what definition of reality? What's our picture of reality? What's our backdrop picture of reality that we're, we're using to base our ethical theory in? Well, then we get into ethical, uh, metaphysical theory. How do we know which one is the right one? But we're always going to have a lot of questions about our ethical theory if we don't ground it in some kind of picture of reality and define it. Immanuel Kant was an ethicist. He was also a metaphysician. He came up with a really good ethical theory. In a sense, we all kind of follow or judge the right action in accordance with what he came up with to, a, to an extent. And he grounded his ethical theory in his metaphysics, which was pretty good too. He grounded his ethics in a picture of reality so that his ethics had some backing to it, some metaphysical backing to it, <clears throat> that gave his ethical theory some strength, regardless of whether we actually feel that it's intuitively correct or actually use it in our everyday thinking. Still, if we want to inquire, well, how do you know that's the way it should be? How do you know that's the right action? How do you know that his theory is pretty good one? Well, he kind of grounds it, you know, like, well, here's the proof. Here's how it fits in reality. It corresponds with reality. And here's my picture of reality, which is a pretty good one. All right. That's our analogy. Self-mastery. Self-mastery. There are techniques and there, there is a sequence of things to do. And it must be grounded in a picture of reality that instruments self-mastery. So, what grand view of reality and how it works are we going to use? Are we going to refer to? There are many. There are many ways of looking at it. Let's say, let's say we have a way of describing the nature of reality that actually corresponds with reality. Still, there are many ways to talk about that, all of which correspond with reality. Many ways to talk about it, many levels of discourse, many points of view, all hitting on the same things, all looking at the same thing in correspondence with reality. And then there's just, you know, a gamut of other descriptions that don't really correspond very well at all. What are we going to use? If putting together a self-mastery training program, we can't include all of them and let the client choose his own, we'll never get going in self-mastery training. We'll just spend our life engaging in armchair philosophy. What we need is to get to the core of how reality operates and choose choose a viewpoint and in, 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 in a, a manner of description and explanation. The core operational principles of reality that correspond with reality to the best of our ability and make sure that what we choose as our metaphysical backdrop for self-mastery training is highly instrumental to self-mastery training. In other words, all of our training, all of our techniques and methods of action that build into a way of being in self-mastery draw from this picture of reality 
how reality operates, how the cosmos works, its operational principles, the laws that it follows, the cosmic principles and laws that it follows. We want our self-mastery training and our self-mastery progress to be in correspondence with those principles. In fact, how else would it work? And we want our way of discussing that metaphysical backdrop, that view of reality and how it works, to be extremely instrumental, extremely have have direct practical application so that the training in self-mastery uses those principles and those laws, those cosmic principles and laws and mental, mental principles and laws of operation to go with it, as well as follows natural laws. That's one thing that me needs to be done, and selecting the right words, selecting the right views, this, the, the right descriptions, and trying to keep it as simple as possible. This is a problem. We could call it a problem when it needs to be solved, and it is solvable, in putting together a self-mastery training program and presenting it to a client. Each client as his or her own starting point with such information. Some such conceptual information may be completely new to a person. Another person might have had access to similar information before but not clearly understood it. They might have had access to information that's similar to it, but it's not as pragmatic. It doesn't lend as well as perhaps the one I've selected, <clears throat> and therefore I need to kind of gear what my conceptual viewpoint is for self-mastery training toward what they already know. Um, these are, again, problems, but not insurmountable. Um, these are the things that must be considered. We could call them considerations rather than problems, but these are uh, some considerations that must be taken into account when putting together a self-mastery training program and presenting it to somebody else, all geared toward their ease of progress in self-mastery. And of course, no true self-mastery can occur without being grounded in the operational principles, the spiritual laws, or cos cosmic laws of operation, or whatever you want to call them, of this manifested cosmos, because This is the cosmos in which we're operating. <laughs> <clears throat> so, the, early on in the game, early on in the process of, of self-mastery training, a metaphysical backdrop must be put into place, a conceptual framework, so the client engaging in self-mastery knows where this is going, knows how it's grounded, knows why it works the way it works, and can intentionally invoke into their thinking, into their very practice, these metaphysical laws, these cosmic laws of operation. Things like, simple things like, most of us have heard of the law of opposites, the principle of polarity, negative and positive, you know, this and that, hot and cold, and so forth. Everything has its opposite. It's all dual in nature. It's a world of duality. On and on we can go. Well, this all these these various ways of <laughs> describing the law of opposites, many of us are familiar with, but many people don't know how to make any use of that in something like self-mastery, but we take it to be perhaps a fundamental operational principle of the universe. But just how many levels of universe are we talking about here? Just the physical universe? Multiple universes? Parallel universes? We need to address this kind of thing as part of our conceptual framework. 
from which we're proceeding. And we want to get to these basic operational principles, like the principle of polarity, and how to use it and apply these principles right into our training. Make best use of them. And keep the client, the, the student, the, the, the person engaging in the self-mastery program, always reminded of what we're doing right here in this lesson, this week. Take note. Take note. Look at the law of opposites at work here. Take note to the principle of polarity that we're using here, that we're taking advantage of, that we're turning into pragmatism, not just some, some theory to intellectualize over. No, we're getting practice. We're using it. Experience with it. Experience that I want you to feel. I want you to visualize and I want you to feel it at work in what you are doing, why we're doing this. These principles need to be taught. They need to be used. They need to be experienced. They need to be felt. And the self-mastery training program itself, itself, should be a little picture of these principles in action itself. Not just the instruction being given, the things that the client or the person is doing to work toward their own self-mastery, applying such principles, but the way that the program is provided to them should also exemplify these principles in action. So that even just going through the self-mastery training program, the person can see how the, the principle of opposites was built right into the self-mastery training program itself, right into the instruction, the way it's put together. So that it too is an example of what's being taught to them. These are not insurmountable problems in self-mastery training and self-mastery progress, but these are things that must be considered. And until they are considered and worked out, I guess you could call them a problem. <laughs> <clears throat> what else do we have? Well, aspects of self-mastery. Many aspects must be considered. Look, one aspect of self-mastery is mastery over one's attention, or one's faculty of mental focus. It's an extremely important part of self-mastery. I mean, without it, none of the other parts are going to work. For one, a person needs to be able to mentally attend to the instructions. If the instruction says, mentally attend, focus your attention as much as possible on every word of instruction. That's part of self-mastery training right there. And, of course, what the instruction is going to be saying is focus your attention on doing, performing this little technique. And while you're doing it, focus your attention as much as possible on what you're doing. And, of course, it's going to be part of self-mastery training also to teach the person exactly how to do that. What it means to focus your attention a little more, with a little more control over it every day. And focus your attention on these instructions every time you read them. Use them as self as, as self-mastery training and as attention training. Well that's just one aspect of the whole thing. If, we, if that's all we did, self-mastery is not going to happen. A person will gain better control over their attention, but it's not going to go very far. Because other things have to happen too. Many things must happen. A person must get control over their, their uses their physical senses better in order to focus the mind better. A person must gain greater control over their emotional states. That helps attention training, right? And of course, attention training is going to help get better control over emotional states. These things all work together. 
willpower training is another aspect of self-mastery progress. But how do you do that without training the attention? And how do you train your attention without bettering your use of the power of will? These things all work together. There are different aspects of self-mastery training. There are many, many aspects. There are so many that could be included that it could make it seem like self-mastery, I say a good self-mastery training program is impossible because it includes way too much. So, a problem to be solved is what things are the most fundamental? What things can we kind of leave out because the things we're going to include will take care of or kind of cover for the things we don't have to really directly address. Which things are fundamental? Do we have to let religion in? Do we have to have, does a person have to be on a spiritual path for it? That's something to consider. Does a person have to engage in, let's say, Kundalini yoga. That's pretty important for gaining mastery over one's instruments of expression and experience in this cosmos. And if we're going to include that, aren't there dangers involved with that? Are the dangers, the potential dangers, of improper practice and improper instruction in this form of yoga worth the benefit, the potential benefit to be derived in a road to self-mastery. These things must be seriously considered. A comprehensive approach is, of course, necessary because self-mastery involves all aspects of life, aspects that most beginning self-mastery clients may not even be aware of at first. But it does include all, of, all aspects of one's life and all component parts of the human being. There are more component parts than most beginning self-mastery clients even know about. We must work at all levels of the person's being, the physical body, mental body, astral body, causal body, and we must get a person into their higher self, let's say, for lack of a better phrase at the moment, just off the top of my head here, as quickly as possible in order for self-mastery to truly be effective and efficient and ethical. And yet, a level of self-mastery must be achieved in order for, to accomplish that. So these things, again, must all work together. This requires a comprehensive approach right from the start. And yet, at the same time, we cannot throw everything at a person all at once. So how do we do it? We have to pick a sequence. Well, there are so many things that could be put into sequence. <laughs> what sequence are we going to use? We have to pick the one that's most pragmatic. We have to follow a logical progression and pick what's going to work best. This takes a lot of thinking. There are problems here to be solved. These are some of them. Now, are there different ways that, this, that one could go about this? Of course. Of course. But if this is a self-mastery training program and we set out a sequence of steps to follow and we establish some general rules that go through throughout and we start providing this in a step-by-step -step program for a client, one of those instructions must be, you must follow these instructions to the letter, no variation. Even though there may be other ways to go about this. I follow the instructions to the letter, even though there may be other ways to go about it. Variations are possible. 
because self-mastery involves a firm control over one's mind. If instructions are given, and a person has agreed right from the start, yes, I will follow the instructions to the letter, then that is a, that is a decision of the will. So you can see, self-mastery will not be occurring if a person then does not follow the instructions to the letter. That's part of self-mastery training, following the instructions to the letter, regardless of what your mind tells you to do otherwise. You want to bring that mind under control? Follow the instructions to the letter. That's part of it. What else do we have? Let me see. Let's, oh, the glare. Well, one other thing that I can think of right now, and I'll probably make another video or two to go here. Deep character change. Self-mastery involves deep character change. Otherwise, we're going to be just stuck with kind of like... <clears throat> I don't know, uh, what, what, how can I put this? A very slight degree of self-mastery without deep character change. So how do we affect that change? Well, that requires some self-mastery. <laughs> so once again, these things feed, feed one another. They help one another. Deep character change, self-mastery. Self-mastery, deep character change. One must affect the other. So that has to be worked in. How do you do that? It does take some consideration, and there are ways to do it. There are ways to do it. That's built into a good self-mastery training program. <clears throat> All right. At this point, I guess I'm just going to cut off this video. It's been going on now for a little bit over a half an hour. I guess that's long enough. This is second video in a series, short series so far, of videos called Problems in Self-Mastery. I'm Tharan Q. Ramacharaka. Please be well.